In this session, we're going to look how the concept of a consciousness-based universe influences scientific presentations related to the Vedic cosmology in different fields such as archaeology and biology. And I'm going to be presenting first, and then after me will be Leif Jensen from Denmark, who will be speaking on intelligent design in a modern Vedic context. And after him will be Isvan Tassi, who has a PhD in history of science from the ELTA, the main science university in Hungary. <clears throat> He'll be speaking on in instincts as a mystery in science. I'm going to say a few words about an insider's view of an alternative archaeology. <clears throat> That's actually the title of a paper that I presented at a meeting of the European Association of Archaeologists. <laughs> it's actually one of dozens of papers I've presented on Vedic perspectives on human origins and antiquity at meetings of the World Archaeological Congress, the European Association of Archaeologists, international conferences on the history of science, and so on. If anybody would be interested in seeing the full text of the paper, it's included in my latest book, My Science, My Religion, which is a collection of 24 papers that I presented on these topics at mainstream international scientific conferences. So just to give you a little flavor of how my own consciousness influences my approach to these topics and how I look at how the consciousness of archaeologists, anthropologists, and others working in these fields influences their approach uh, will perhaps lead your consciousness to change a little bit. <laughs> <clears throat> so the, the, the paper, as I said, was published. <clears throat> um, to understand my approach, you have to appreciate that I'm a, I regard myself or I present myself in those circles as a transcultural person. <clears throat> I was born in the West, but I became the disciple of a guru from India and uh, became part of another knowledge tradition. <clears throat> and as part of that consciousness of my identity, I've taken guidance from the Puranas, which are the Vedic historical writings and cosmological text. And they give an account of what I call extreme human antiquity, uh, the idea that humans like us have been present on Earth for vast periods of time. The Vedic literatures in general are full of references to such persons. <clears throat> of course, this is somewhat different from the modern consensus and modern science on human origins and antiquity, which would say that the first humans like us appeared on Earth less than 200,000 years ago. So you may ask yourself, given that perspective, how am I able to walk into a meeting of the European Association of Archaeologists and get a hearing <clears throat> and be published. <laughs> um, I did a careful study of the groups that I was planning on 
interacting with. And I found that among archaeologists, there are basically two groups. One I call the archaeology group, and the other I call the archaeologies group. <clears throat> And those in the archaeology singular group, they tend to accept one objective, empirical, professional archaeology united in presenting its best supported narrative to the public. <clears throat> but that's only part of the world of archaeology. There are many who are part of the archaeologies group, and uh, and indeed, uh, the World Archaeological Congress's journal is called Archaeologies in the plural. And if you look at their editorial statement, you'll see that they emphasize such things as diversity, multivocality, indigenous and post colonial approaches to archaeology and the importance of non-Western epistemologies. So that gives me uh, some space within their framework. <clears throat> they can relate to what I'm doing in terms of that basic outlook. I'm not saying that this is the only way to do things or the best way to do things, but it's one way to approach this question. So what can I say in archeological circles about the Puranic accounts of extreme human antiquity? I can't give them a statement from the Puranas as evidence. What I can do is make a prediction if the Puranic accounts of extreme human antiquity are true, there should be reports of archeological evidence for humans existing millions of years ago. And the methodology for testing that prediction in terms of the history of archeology span is to look at all the archeological reports from the time of Darwin up to the present, let's say. And when that's done, we find there are many reports of archeological evidence for extreme human antiquity in the scientific literature, past and present. <clears throat> and uh, Richard Thompson, Sadabudabu, and I collected hundreds of such reports in this book, Forbidden Archaeology. And I'll just give a, an example or two. In the 19th century, gold was discovered in California. Miners went there to get it. They dug tunnels into the sides of mountains like Table Mountain in the Sierra Nevada Mountains. And in those tunnels, the miners found human bones and human artifacts and layers of rock that modern geologists tell us belong to the early part of the geological period called the Eocene, which would mean if these things are not intrusive, they would be about 50 million years old. These discoveries were reported to the scientific world by Dr. J.D. Whitney, the chief government geologist of California. He published these reports in his work, The Auriferous Gravels of the Sierra Nevada of California, published by Harvard University in the year 1880. <clears throat> we don't hear very much about these discoveries today because of what we call a process of knowledge filtration that operates in the world of science. This is William Holmes, who was an anthropologist working at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. And he wrote, uh, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, if Dr. Whitney had understood the theory of 
human evolution, he would have he he would have hesitated to announce those conclusions, despite the imposing array of testimony with which he was confronted. In other words, if the facts didn't support the theory, they had to be cast into doubt. Um, some of the artifacts from the California gold mines are still in the Museum of Anthropology at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, they're not displayed to the public. They're in a storage room a few miles from the museum, but they are there, and I got permission from the directors of the museum to examine and photograph them for a paper I presented at a meeting of the World Archaeological Congress. Uh, these are some of the artifacts from the California gold mines. Uh, here's uh, one of them, a mortar found in the Boston Company mine uh, at about uh, 1,800 feet from the mouth of the mine, which was drilled into the side of uh, Table Mountain. <clears throat> Uh, this mortar and pestle were found between 1,400 and 1,500 feet from the mouth of the Montezuma Tunnel at Table Mountain. So there were many discoveries like this. And, you know, sometimes people will say, well, that was from the 19th century. That's pretty old. But let's look at another example from recent archaeological history. In 2015, archaeologists reported finding a finger bone, small thing, but it, there's an important lesson to be learned here. Uh, they found a finger bone at uh, Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania in layers of rock 1,840,000 years old. It's from Nature Communications. <clears throat> this is the bone. Technically, it's called the left fifth proximal manual phalanx, and it was designated OH86. That's the specimen number. Uh, the archaeologists carefully studied the bone. They measured it, and they compared the measurements to the same finger bone and different species of apes, monkeys, different kinds of hominins like Australopithecus and Homo erectus. They also compared it to anatomically modern human finger bones. They found it fit squarely in the human group and not in the ape and monkey and hominin groups. Now, <clears throat> here's what they said in their report. OH86 represents a hominin species whose closest form affinities are to modern Homo sapiens. However, the geological age of OH86 obviously precludes its assignment to Homo sapiens. <clears throat> it's just a, a, a modern example of how one's consciousness can influence how one evaluates different categories of evidence that come to one's attention. <clears throat> My conclusion would be there's no reason to suppose why we couldn't say OH86 should be assigned to Homo sapiens and be given an age of 1,840,000 years. So the significance is this evidence is consistent with the accounts of extreme human antiquity found in the Puranas. Uh, and Again, you know, some people will object to bringing in something from a, a Vedic source or a biblical source or any other type of spiritual source into a scientific discussion. But uh, in his review of Forbidden Archaeology, archaeologist Tim Murray said, Forbidden Archaeology provides the historian of archaeology with a useful compendium of case studies <coughs> in the history and sociology of scientific knowledge which can be used to foster debate within archaeology 
about how to describe the epistemology of one's discipline. And that's exactly what we were uh, attempting to do. He also says, uh, forbidden archaeology is de designed to demolish the case for biological and cultural evolution and to advance the cause of a Vedic alternative. Guilty as charged. <laughs> now, here's a very interesting thing he says. The dominant paradigm has changed and is changing, and practitioners openly debate issues which go right to the conceptual core of the discipline. Whether the Vedas have a role to play in this is up to the individual scientist's concern. Very enlightened position, as far as I can see. Something I can completely endorse. So, where does this take us, really, this archaeological evidence for extreme human antiquity? It leads us to contemplate new theories of human origins based on the idea that a human being is something more than just a machine made of molecules and that we're really, uh, at our essence, beings of pure consciousness. Thank you.